Good morning. Good morning. Open your Bibles with me this morning to the book of Acts in chapter 2. Now, uh, I didn't expect to be standing here this morning, and uh, as you know, my brother John was scheduled to be here today. I will convey to him uh, all of the disappointment that you have expressed to me. But 2020 being what it is, the governor of New Jersey has imposed travel restrictions. They're updated every Tuesday. And uh, last Tuesday, he continued the restrictions such that to prevent travel between New Jersey and the state of Maryland. And so John and I were emailing on Wednesday, and then we were talking about that here this evening, or uh, talking about that here on Thursday, and it was decided uh, that the better thing to do would be to find another date when he could be here in person. And uh, so here I am. Uh, I also thought to perhaps make a virtue of a necessity. Uh, over the past few weeks, we've put forward for discussion some initiatives concerning women's ministries. And speaking for the elders, I want to thank you for the many excellent comments and questions that we've received, uh, they run quite the spectrum of opinion. One theme in them is for us to talk about this from the platform. So today, because I of necessity have to reach for something that's familiar, I thought to also use this opportunity to bring a word that would both be of general applicability, but also might be helpful and I trust edifying on some of the points that we're discussing. So this morning I'd like to tell you a story, and it is just about my favorite story in all the Bible. It's a story that spans two continents, three churches, and four decades, and in the words of Shakespeare, we're going to try to turn the accomplishments of many years into an hourglass. Our story starts in the city of Jerusalem, about the year 32 AD, or CE, as you prefer, Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were, they were, with one, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues, of, divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are, these not all, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each in our own language in which we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Perga and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. May the Lord bless, giving us a good understanding of his word this morning. The protagonists of our story are two Christians, a man and a woman, a husband and a wife. And although they lived long ago, I think that you're going to recognize them like Christians that you know today who live life with, nobil with, the, with the nobility of purpose and a sense of adventure that comes from being born into the new life in Jesus Christ. Our story is going to jump forward to the year 49 and to the city of Rome. The emperor in 49 is Tiberius Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus, better known to history as Claudius Caesar. He is the fourth Roman emperor. The first emperor was Augustus. He was the emperor when Jesus was born. Christmas programs without number have recounted the words from Luke chapter 2 that it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. 
The second emperor was Tiberius. He was the emperor when Jesus was preaching and when he was crucified. He's mentioned by name in Luke chapter 3. Third emperor was Gaius Caligula, whose name has come down to us, synonymous with uh, incompetence, pomposity, debauchery, and ultimately insanity. He was uh, assassinated in the fourth year of his reign, basically for the good of everybody else. That was the only way you could, uh, you couldn't impeach an emperor, you had to assassinate him. And I don't think anybody cried at his funeral. And upon his death, his uncle Claudius becomes emperor. Claudius being chosen because he's the only living member of the royal family. Caligula in his paranoia having murdered all of the rest. Claudius is 51 years old when he becomes emperor. He never really expected or even wanted the job. He was an intelligent man. He was interested in architecture and history, but he wasn't charismatic or inspiring. He walked with a limp. He talked with a stammer. And if you were to describe his personality in one word, it might be boring. He saw his job as sort of being the administrator-in-chief of the empire, keeping the streets clean, keeping the budgets balanced, keeping the trade routes open. But after Caligula's incompetence and insanity, uh, boring looked pretty good, and Claudius Caesar would reign for 13 years. One thing that Claudius definitely was not, he was not religious. He was a public man, so he did the public observances, but he had neither interest nor faith in the supposed Roman pantheon of gods. He himself actually declined the honor of being made a god. The Roman Senate sent him word that they had voted him a god, and they had set a date for his deification. He sent back word that that was nice, but he was busy that day, he had other things to do, and maybe I can become a god some other time. But Claudius recognized that the empire was covered with a patchwork of religions, and each one was important to the local populace, and it was important to keeping the peace, so Claudius' policy towards religion becomes... Uh, whatever. You can worship whatever you want. You can worship whoever you want. You can worship however you want. But I don't want it disturbing the peace. People can get angry and upset and they can fight over religion. We're not going to have any of that. And so you can worship however you want, but you keep it in your temples, you keep it in your synagogues, you keep it in your homes. I don't want it out in the streets. In the early years of Claudius' reign, we start to pick up in the administrative records of the empire indications of a distemper among the Jews. By this time, Jews lived all over the empire, all over the Hellenistic world, the world of Greek language and Greek values and Greek philosophy. They're called the Jews of the dispersion. They worshipped in synagogues and were taught by rabbis. When Peter writes his first letter, he addressed it to the pilgrims of the dispersion, to Jews in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And in the 40s, we start to pick up evidence of a dispute a theological argument that's going on among these Jews. Remember that this is a world without mass media of any kind. News travels by story and rumor and gossip, and so it takes a long time for an understanding of current events to make its way into the public conscience. From a Roman standpoint, what was happening was an intramural squabble of theology between two different strands of Judaism. One of them was a conservative, rabbinical Judaism that had existed in the Hellenistic world for more than two centuries. Jews who maintained their distinctions and worshipped in their synagogues and obeyed their rabbis. But now there was something new. There was a doctrine that was young and energetic and intellectually muscular and above all, it was messianic. It insisted that the words of the prophets were more than of cultural significance, that the words of the prophets should be taken literally, and that the promises of God for salvation to Israel and the world were actually going to be fulfilled. And more than that, that their fulfillment was happening now. 
And this debate was going on all in synagogues all over the empire about events that had happened in Jerusalem where there was a young prophet who preached that the kingdom of God was at hand and he attracted a large following and he was crucified. And some are saying that he rose from the dead and that he is the Christ. And as good students of the Bible, you know what that is. That's the beginning of the spread of the gospel. As we read in Acts 2 on Pentecost, there were Jews gathered in Jerusalem from all over the empire. Jews who kept the commandments and followed the traditions. There were Parthians and Medes and Elamites. There were people from Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, from Pontus and Asia and and Perga and Pamphylia, from Egypt, and from Libya, and from Cyrene, and from Crete, and even from Rome itself. Doubtless, many of them had been there at the Passover 53 days before, and they had seen and heard what had happened when Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. And now, they were witnessing the fulfillment of the words of the prophet Joel, and the fulfillment of the words of David, And they heard Peter saying, therefore, let all the house of Israel know, all the house of Israel, those of Judea and those of the dispersion, that God has made this Jesus, who you crucified, to be both Lord and Christ. 3,000 were saved that day, doubtless many from Judea, doubtless many from those faraway places. Peter expressly tells them to take the message back with them when they returned, saying, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call, and in a day the gospel of Jesus Christ becomes a seed on the wind carried across the empire. These men and women returned home with a message that was new, that was exciting, that was vigorous, and that was messianic. Now, when they returned home, they were still very much Jews. I mean, no one had ever heard of being a Christian. They still revered the Torah, and they kept the traditions, and they listened to the rabbis, and they had no dealings with the Gentiles. It would be about 20 years before the Apostle Paul went on his journeys explaining and putting structure to the theology of what they now believed and teaching that the old distinctions of Jew and Gentile had been broken down and that God was creating something new, a new body, a new church. And so these believers returned to their synagogues and as their numbers grew, so did the opposition. Old line rabbinical Judaism was not accepting of this new doctrine. Disputes and arguments and then, it, then suppression by violence followed. And now it was spilling out of the synagogues and into the streets. And it happened repeatedly in various cities. And the emperor Claudius was not happy about it at all. In the year 42, Claudius wrote a letter to the city of Alexandria. Alexandria had the largest Jewish population in the world. Just like today, there are more Jews living in New York than in Jerusalem. Alexandria was where the Septuagint was written, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And Claudius made particular mention of the disputes among the Jews. As for the question which party was responsible for the riots and feud, or rather, if the truth be told, the war with the Jews, I was unwilling to make a a strict inquiry. I don't care. I don't care who's right. Though guarding within me a store of immutable indignation against whichever party renews the conflict. And I tell you once and for all that unless you put a stop to this ruinous and obstinate enmity against each other, I shall be driven to show what a benevolent prince can be when turned to righteous indignation. I will by all means take vengeance on them as fomenters of that which is a general plague infecting the whole world. Claudius was not happy. Well, Claudius' letter uh, didn't solve the problem. 
the violent suppression of new Messianic Judaism continued. There was even trouble in Rome. And in 49, Claudius expelled all Jews from Rome. Everybody out, both sides, for constant disturbance due to this question of the Christ. So now let's move our scene, transport our scene to Corinth, and it's two years later. And turn with me, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 18, where we will be on Paul's second missionary journey and where we will pick up the account in verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to Jews that Jesus is the Christ. Aquila and Priscilla would have left Rome in 49, and now it's two years later. Now, I'm sure that everybody here has heard of the Olympic Games and knows that they, are, they were held every four years and knows that the modern Olympics are inspired by the games in ancient Greece at Mount Olympus where you see the logo, uh, and that's where those games were held. But the Greeks absolutely loved sports, couldn't get enough of them. And there were other games besides the Olympics, and they were held at, at Esmithia, which is just outside of Corinth. You know our word isthmus? That's where it comes from. They were held every other year, the year before and the year after the Olympic Games. And they were huge. There were foot races, and there were chariot races, and gymnastics, and wrestling, and boxing, and throwing discus and javelin. There were also contests in poetry and singing. Imagine that, singing as an Olympic sport. Kind of like the Super Bowl and the Masked Singer all rolled up into one. Athletes came from all over Greece. Romans were allowed to enter, creating an international flavor. And every two years, people would pour into, pour into Corinth from all over Greece and from Corinth out to the games, which would last five days. So, suppose that you're a big sports fan and you're going to the games. And I mean, you're going to have a great time. You're going to cheer for the Corinthians. You're going to boo the Athenians. You're going to heckle the Romans. You're going to yell at the refs. You're going to tailgate. You're going to drink root beer with your friends. It's going to be a great time. <laughs> so let me ask you, where are you going to stay? It's a wide open rural area. There are no holiday inns anywhere around. Where are you going to stay for five days? You are going to need a tent. And where is that tent going to come from? Are you going to schlep that tent with you as you come from Thebes or down from Rhodes? No! You are going to buy your tent in Corinth. And so every two years when the games were on, as they were in 51, there is a boom market for tent makers in Corinth. And probably that opportunity has drawn a man named Aquila and his wife Priscilla who were in the business of tent making. Aquila and Priscilla were Jews. Now, he was born in Pontus, which is a Roman province on the Black Sea. When Peter wrote his letter to the pilgrims of the dispersion, he mentions Pontus specifically. Aquila had come to Rome, maybe earlier in life, maybe later. He had married, and he and Priscilla had heard the message of Christ and believed. Exactly where, we don't know. 
But both Pontus and Rome are mentioned in Acts 2. So it is distinctly possible, and I like it to imagine it to be so, that they were in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost and could have been among the 3,000 that were saved. What we do know is that they were in Rome when Claudius issued his edict, and they left Italy not knowing that it was to be the start of a lifetime of adventure in the gospel. And now they're in Corinth, working as tent makers, maybe trying to settle down, maybe there just for the immediate opportunity. There's a synagogue in Corinth where they would attend every Sabbath, believing all things written in the law of the prophets. And now there's a new voice in that synagogue, an outspoken advocate of messianic Judaism that they also believe. It was Paul the Apostle who was coming down through the cities of Macedonia and Achaia. And now he's joined by Silas and Timothy. And they're preaching that Jesus is the Christ. Paul always worked for a living in every city that he visited. He said to the Thessalonians, These hands have provided for my necessities so that I will not be a financial burden to any of you. And now Aquila and Priscilla have him stay at their home. And he picks up work with them, making tents. Imagine the conversations over dinner. Aquila and Priscilla are mentioned by name six times in the New Testament. Three times in the book of Acts, then in Romans, 1 Corinthians, and 2 Timothy. Notice that they are always mentioned together. The scripture says of marriage that a man and a woman become one flesh. Jesus said, so then they are no longer two, but one flesh. That's the way Aquila and Priscilla were. You never once read that Aquila did this. You never once read that Priscilla did that. They, do, they act together in everything that they do. They are an economic partnership. We read in Acts 18 that they, plural, were tent makers. They are a ministry partnership. We read that Paul stayed with them. In Acts 18, 26, when Aquila and Priscilla heard Apollos, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. It was to the city, it, it, it was to that city where they, they, they took it, you know. I'm sorry. There is today, there is today, well, let me say this. There's a second thing that I want you to notice in this scripture. That they are sometimes, that, that in these six verses, they are three times referred to as Priscilla and Aquila, and three times referred to as Priscilla and Aquila. Aquila and Priscilla three times, Priscilla and Aquila the other three. Not only are they a partnership, but there is between them an equality. There is today a criticism of Christianity and a criticism of Scripture based on a supposed suppression of women. That is not true. And that is based largely on a misunderstanding, or sometimes an outright distortion, of a principle in the Bible that is called headship. Paul writes that, that, the, that he praises them, that they keep the traditions, and he wants them to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Headship means the, it, the voluntary submission, the voluntary taking of a lesser place and the covering of one's glory, the covering of your individual attributes for the honor of another. Just as Christ covered his glory, that the glory of God would be seen. This is something that permeates 
everything we do as a church, and it brings together everything that we believe concerning the way the church functions. It's not something where the church, it's not a concept that's relegated to a particular subject or to a particular corner. But we, it flows down into everything that we do. We believe that a church behaves itself modestly. When we built this building, we did so not to build something that was impressive and, and grand, but something that was simple and utilitarian. Our ministries are designed not to, uh, not to preach at the world, but to, but to serve and to minister to the world. Men stand here without title or without robes and present, our, our goal was that you would not hear us but that you would hear the Bible. Women serve. The same concept flows down to, to the women who, ser- who re- reflect it in, in quietness and reverence in our public meetings. Now, the world does not understand this. The world is clueless concerning it. And the world into which these words were written had, uh, had no idea. The world divides people. It divides them by generation, by race, by class, by gender. And into that world, the Apostle Paul wrote this. For as many as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither slave nor free, There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. The world believes that equality means that each different part, each different group, gets their own own share of honor and value and money. But the gospel of Jesus Christ functions on a, on a whole other principle. It functions not on the principle of the division of honor, the division of assets, but on the oneness that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. The world had never seen, and still to this day has never seen, something like the gospel of Jesus Christ, where in one place, around one table, would sit down men and women, Jew and Gentile, Greeks and barbarians, rich and poor, young and old, men and women, and they would come and sit down together, even slaves and their owners, who would come and be one in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the world does not understand this, and it never has. The Greek world into which the Apostle Paul wrote these words was a world that considered that, uh, well, let me put it this way. I could uh, spend a long time putting up on this screen, I could fill this screen with derogatory quotes concerning, uh, from the best of Greek minds, concerning uh, the Greek attitude towards women. Neither time, nor I think your patience, would allow a discussion of Greek literature and feminism in Greek literature, whether it's the Medea by Euripides or uh, Sophocles' uh, uh, Antigone, although I know how interested that you would be in all of that. But the world, the, the world has spent thousands of years trying to catch up with what the Scripture says concerning... Uh, 
concerning women. I could, as I said, I could put up a lot of quotes. It would make for great shock value. And they're, and they're, uh, and, and uh, it would make for great shock value, but I don't think that that would be the best way to look at it. It was into that world, it was into that world that the, um, that the example of Aquila and Priscilla burned like a torch. It was into that world where women were considered property, where the purpose of marriage was limited to just the, the production of male offspring, that the Apostle Paul wrote this. That the Apostle Paul wrote this. Let the husband render to the... Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have, any, does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. This is a verse that is um, often talked about regarding um, sexual relations. But I think that it goes much further than that. This is a verse that, hey, everything that I do, I do in my body. And so I think this verse goes as far as to talk about everything, everything on a daily basis that a husband can, can, can use or that a husband can do, to, excuse me, that a husband can do to show love and affection to his wife and everything that a wife can do to show affection and honor to her husband, serving one another, supporting one another, accommodating one another, encouraging one another. It is the triumph of the gospel that we accept these words as obviously true. In a world in which they were written, they were revolutionary. They were almost unbelievable. Nobody had ever heard of such a concept. Aquila and, and Priscilla operate as one, as a partnership, whether it's economic or, or ministry. Their example has been a great inspiration to Vicki and I. We have a side venture where we fund the startup of Christian businesses, or we help in the purchase of houses, and it is called P&A Opportunities. It's registered with the State Department of Assessments and Taxation as P&A Opportunities. Paul would write of marriage that it is a great mystery. It is hard to see. It is hard to understand. You cannot find a marriage like theirs anywhere in Greek literature. You can search Homer. And, Eurip and, and Euripides and Sophocles and all the rest. You cannot find a happy marriage. And yet marriages like this abound throughout the churches of the New Testament. Paul wrote a letter to Philemon, who lived in Colossae. We call this letter the epistle to Philemon, but it's actually addressed to Philemon and his wife, Aphia. He calls her the beloved of Thea. In 1 Corinthians 9, we read about the wife of Peter and the wives of other, of the other apostles who would accompany them on the ministry. In Romans 16, Paul sends greetings to Christians there and mentions several couples, Andronicus and Eunia. He says that they're of note among the apostles. Everybody knows them, and they were in Christ before him. Philologus and Eulia, again, speaking of them as though they were one person. Like you can't mention one of them without the other, like and is their middle name. Peter writes that a husband and wife are heirs together in the grace of life. Most often when that verse is used is when we rejoice at the birth of a child heirs together in the grace of life. So far as we know, Aquila and Priscilla did, did not have children, but they carried the grace of life in Jesus Christ together, making a life in the gospel on a higher plane than the world imagined. Paul leaves Corinth after 18 months, and he goes to Ephesus. 
Priscilla and Aquila go with him. I would love to listen in on that conversation as they decided together to go to Ephesus. I imagine Paul bringing it up. Come with me to Ephesus. Start a work there. Then uh, Priscilla and Aquila talking to Paul, talking to Paul about it, and then talking about it together. Corinth isn't really home. We've worked here for 18 months. Church can stand on its own. Here's a chance to start something new. Let's go. And so they did. Paul doesn't stay long in Ephesus. He's pushing to get back to Antioch and really wants to reach Jerusalem. But Aquila and Priscilla are going to stay and minister in Ephesus. And that's where they meet Apollos, which I mentioned earlier. A few years later, Paul arrives back in Ephesus on his third missionary journey and finds the church there strong and healthy and growing. This is from Ephesus, where he writes what we call 1 Corinthians. Back to the people at that church where he spent those 18 months. At the end of the letter, at the end of 1 Corinthians, he tells them that here in Ephesus, a great and effective door had opened for the gospel. Then he adds this. The churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. There is a wholesomeness in that verse. There is a sense of unity and edification there. Aquila and Priscilla are still there. And they greet you heartily in the Lord. And now there's a church in their house. In New Testament days, there was no church building as we have. Rather, they met in private homes. People who would open, open their homes for the remembrance of the Lord in the breaking of bread and the exhortation of believers. As we saw early, that earlier that the church in Colossae met in the home of Philemon and Aphia. And so here in Ephesus where there's a great and effective door open for the gospel, the church meets in the home of Aquila and Priscilla. They've been in Ephesus for about three years, best I can tell, and now they're ready to move again. In the year 54, Claudius Caesar died. He was followed by his stepson, a brash young man named Nero Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus, who history just knows as Nero. Nero comes to power, anxious to show grace and win favor, and among his first acts is to lift the expulsion of the Jews from Rome. Word reaches Ephesus, and Aquila and Priscilla talk about going back. Again, I imagine their talks between themselves when they get the news with the Christians in Ephesus. I can imagine the farewell fellowship when they decide to go, like we would have here. And it's just about three years after that that Paul writes his famous letter to the the Christians in Rome. And at the end of the letter, he sends greetings to those in Rome that he knew. And the first ones he mentions are Priscilla and Aquila. He calls them my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, which is the phrase that Paul used when he really wanted to compliment someone. My fellow workers in Christ. Then he says that they risked their necks for his life. There had been violence in Corinth in Acts 18. There had been violence in Ephesus. Remember when we did the Philippians study? And we talked about the violence in Ephesus in Acts 19. And I expect that there are many stories of heroism that we don't know about. And Priscilla and Aquila had been right there. Then Paul said, I give thanks. He not only says he gives thanks for them, he says, I give thanks to them. He gives thanks for their fellowship. He gives thanks for their effort. He gives thanks for their sacrifice. He gives thanks for their sharing in the work of the gospel over the years. And then Paul says, not only do I give thanks for them, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Aquila and Priscilla were Jews. But when Jesus Christ broke down the wall of separation, they were among the first over the rubble that was left And on the other side, extending a hand of faith and fellowship to those 
who were previously excluded, and they never stopped doing that. And then Paul says, likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Would you expect anything less? Just as they went to Corinth and took Paul in to stay with them, and just as they went to Ephesus and the church there met at their house, now they're back in Rome and again at the center of ministry, offering their home, building the work. The last view we get of them is some years later in Paul's last letter written from prison in Rome in the days before his death to Timothy. And to me, this is the most romantic. Paul was now an old man. A few years before, he had written that letter to Philemon and Aphia. And there he calls himself Paul the Aged. And now he says that the time of my departure is at hand. A new, young, strong generation has risen in the church. And Paul's generation is fading away. Onesiphorus is dead. Say hello to his family. Trimotheus is sick. Erastus stayed in Corinth, maybe too old to travel. But Priscilla and Aquila are still going. The last distant view that we get of them before they go over the hill. They are still together. They are still in the fight. They are still reaching out. They are still changing the world. And Timothy, when you see them, say hello for me. You know, there are myriads of ways in Christian ministries here and elsewhere where we, are, where we serve as individuals and where we utilize and highlight individual abilities and personalities. And that's true for people whether they're married or not. Some who are younger in life, some older and their spouse has passed on or divorced or choosing to live single. And all such ministry and service is of great value. It is the manifestation of the Spirit of God and it is worthy of respect and honor. But to me, and I'll just speak personally for just a minute, this is just from me. There is something to be said for the value of a husband and wife serving together. Paul writes that this union is a great mystery. It's hard to see. It's not immediately obvious. And so speaking just for myself, I submit that there is value in a church finding ways to intentionally show that partnership and that oneness publicly. For a husband and wife to be seen as working together, for a husband and wife to be seen as, showing, as, as praying together. To try as a church to intentionally mimic that. I think that being a Christian is the best thing in the world. I think being a Christian is the best thing in the world. Being saved by faith in Jesus Christ, being born into new life in him. And one of the best benefits that comes from being a Christian is knowing you, knowing other Christians, knowing and working with men and women who are born of the same faith, who have the same spirit of God and rejoice in the same hope. And I believe that we, this church, can be like them, strong in doctrine, committed unshaken to the commandments of the Lord, Diligent in study, seeking understanding, unified in love and purpose, abounding in liberty and determined to use that liberty, as the scripture says, to serve our own generation 
and those who do not yet believe. May the grace of the Lord be evident, and let the blessing of the Lord be upon all that we do and say. Thank you for listening, even to this halted effort this morning. I thank you for listening, and promise as we go through these discussions to listen to you today, to listen to you, even as you have listened to me. Let's pray, and then we will be finished. Our Father, we pray for the God, we pray thanking you for our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray thanking you, our Father, for the wonderful gospel that you have given to us. And we pray as you open the door in Ephesus that you would open a door here that the gospel of Jesus Christ would reach many, that there would be many who would be saved. And our Father, we pray that, um, your, that, that you would bless us with a spirit of unity and edification, commitment unto your word, and commitment unto one another. We give thanks now and commit this rest of the day to you. In Christ's name, amen. And our meeting is dismissed.